Hello. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I was speaking to Michael before, and we agreed that I think uh, my talk is the polar opposite of Michael's in that I haven't got any equations in this. I think if you want to do your maths fix, then you've had it with Michael's talk. So mine's mainly videos, uh, images, high-level um, overview of the work I'm doing. Um, really what I'm trying to do is get you into the mind of a robot and think about how, it, how deep learning and machine learning more generally works in the physical world of robotics, which is very different to a lot of the applications of machine learning because actually we don't really have robotics data sort of freely available. And a lot of the big breakthroughs in machine learning have come from us you know, as consumers and just people across the world freely providing our data, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. And there's all of this data about, out there that people can uh, use to do machine learning on. With robotics, well, robo robots are things that you know, we've created ourselves. They don't kind of exist in the world providing us uh, data for free. So we've got to think very differently about how, um, how data is acquired from robots and therefore think really carefully about data efficiency because it's very, very difficult to collect lots of data in the physical world. It's very, very expensive. So a lot of my work is about applying deep learning and machine learning more generally to robots and thinking about how we can make it work uh, for physical robotics. So, <clears throat> so first of all, imagine, think about this question here. We've got, this is, this is my robot in my lab. So the red thing is a robot. Um, it's got a camera on it. So if you look uh, just above where the hammer is, there's a little camera mounted to the wrist. So that's an RGB camera. Um, the robot's holding a hammer. And there's this nail, this sort of toy nail beneath it. Um, imagine you wanted to teach a robot to hammer in that nail. Say you wanted to, this is one of the skills that you wanted a robot to have. Um, and when I say to teach the robot hammer in a nail, what I mean is to give it the ability to do, do something like this. First of all, provide that swinging motion, but also when the nail moves around the table, then the robot can then hammer in the nail wherever the nail is. So it's not simply a matter of just you know, re repeating a sequence of uh, torques or velocities. Um, it's actually giving the robot the ability to find that nail on the table and then move to the nail and then, and then interact with it. So that's what I mean by teaching a robot how to hammer in and out. So imagine you, you wanted to do that yourselves. How would you, how would you do this? Well, you could, you could engineer um, a system. You could say, right, I'm going, to, I'm going to take my image. I'm going to figure out, OK, where is that nail? Maybe I'm going to um, you know, find this sort of orangey region. Um, also, maybe have another camera that finds where the, the hammer is. And you're going to measure the length of the hammer with a ruler or something, figure out where the hammer needs to go, and then think about what you think the velocity needs to be in order to interact with the nail. So you could do that. And you know, at the end of you know, maybe a few hours of work, you might be able to get a system that works like that with a lot of engineering. Um, but of course, there's, there's lots and lots of hammers in the world. OK, there's lots and lots of hammers. And if you were to engineer a controller like this, you would have to factor in, take into account that all hammers have different weights and sizes and colors. All the nails have different colors and shapes as well. So you couldn't really just engineer this system together. Or at least if you did, it would take a very long time. It would be very complex. Um, and we don't really want to do that kind of. This is sort of old-fashioned uh, robotics, if you like. Um, and of course, that's just with hammers. You know, think about the world beyond hammering a nail. Uh, you know, I do a lot of work with Dyson, and we want robots to go into people's homes and interact with objects in everyday environments. So if you think about all of the objects in the world, we're, we're not really going to be able to just engineer systems to deal with every single object. And this is where machine learning comes in. Of course, that's, that's where machine learning came in in lots of applications, like in the early applications to computer vision, ImageNet, for example, be before big, the big deep learning breakthrough, a lot of the features were engineered, and we were manually engineering systems. And then deep learning came along, and we started to be able to learn things. So that's what ro robot learning is all about. It's about getting machine learning and, and mainly deep learning, but also other areas of machine learning, like Gaussian processes, getting these systems into robotics, into the physical world. So in robot learning, we would have a load of data. We would do some machine learning on it. And then the thing that you're predicting is the physical action that you want the robot to take. So maybe the velocity or the position you want the mo to uh, move the robot to or the torques in the motors. But it's all about physically interacting with the world. So how would you collect the data for, to teach a robot? So we, as I said, we need lots and lots of data in robotics. We need lots of data in in any application of deep learning. In robotics, 
that data is not freely available. There isn't, you can't just sort of Google images and then find a load of images and apply that here because we don't have the actions that the robots have taken for those images. So we need to get that data somehow. One of the most promising ways to do that is through imitation learning, which is humans providing demonstrations of tasks. It's kind of the equivalent of um, humans labeling images for something like ImageNet, where you've got an image and then you've got a label for it, but this is in the physical world. So how do we collect physical data? Well, one way is to simply provide demonstrations. So this is me teaching uh, the robot that I showed you before. It's the same robot, and I'm teaching it how to hammer it in the nail, and it's just a little demonstration like that. Um, that's the data I use to collect, to train that robot that I, that I showed you before. And actually, that's the only physical interaction I needed. And I'm going to explain a little bit how, how I propagate this uh, data uh, so that the robot can actually then learn that task. So that, that's how I collect data in my lab. It's all about imitation learning. Um, and there's two kind of goals I, I have in mind when I'm developing my imitation learning algorithms. One is to minimize the amount of physical action required of the human. So we want, we want data to be very easy to provide from a human. We don't want the humans to have to be specialists in their understanding of the algorithms. And the reason for this is because my vision is that if we're going to get that huge amount of data collected that has led to breakthroughs in, in many different applications of deep learning, we're going to have to have everyday people teaching robots rather than just the specialists in the labs. We're going to have to scale this up to people all over the world teaching robots in everyday environments. So we need this to be very, very easy for humans to do. And so we want to minimize the physical interaction. We, we, we want people to be able to teach robots very easily. Secondly, we want to minimize the amount of prior task knowledge required by the algorithm. So we don't want to have different algorithms for different tasks. We don't want to say, OK, is this a hammering type task? Therefore, use method A. Is this a grasping task? Use method B. Is this an opening a door task? Use method C. We want one algorithm to be applied to all of these different tasks. Because again, that means that the human teaching the robot doesn't have to have an underlying understanding of the algorithm. They can just teach the robot, and the robot learns autonomously by itself, regardless of what the task is that the human wants the robot to learn. So these are the two criteria that I work within when designing my imitation learning methods. I'm going to, I'm going to show you the limitations of two kind of traditional approaches to this. So in, in Machine learning, we're often taught at university, OK, there's three types of machine learning, supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and unsupervised learning. It's the same in robotics. Um, so if you were to teach a robot with supervised learning, you could collect lots and lots of demonstrations, collect images from that camera. So the camera mounted to the wrist again. Every time you provide, uh, uh, you move the robot a little bit, there's an image and an action. And you're collecting at 30 frames a second. So you've got lots and lots of data here. And you just provide, you just train with supervised learning. The problem with this is it's very, very labor intensive. You would probably need over 100 demonstrations to teach a robot just with supervised learning to do this task. That's just that one single task. That's a lot, a lot of effort. So we want to be much better than that. It doesn't conform to that first criteria that I set myself of making it easy and minimizing the human effort. Then we could apply reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is very, very trendy these days. It's, uh, everybody loves it. But in robotics, it's not quite as easy as that. And you'll, you'll understand why in about five seconds. The whole point of reinforcement learning is the robot has to mess up in order to then learn from its failures. And of course, that requires a human to have to be there to physically reset the environment all the time. So even though there's lots and lots of really exciting work in reinforcement learning, it's mainly based on learning in simulations. Um, and actually, when you go into the real world, all of these assumptions that people have been working within when developing their algorithms for simulations are just very, uh, they don't really conform with real world robot learning. Um, so I want to move away from supervised learning because it's very, it requires a human to provide lots of data. I want to move away from reinforcement learning because it requires a human to uh, keep resetting the scene. Um, and there's an inductive bias that I, I decided to work within. Um, and it looks a little bit like this. So the, the first part of a trajectory, when a, an ob a robot is reaching an object, we don't really need demonstrations there physically. All we need to know is that the robot should move from point A to point B. Okay, it doesn't really matter what the trajectory is. In fact, it's, the best trajectory is probably just a straight line. So that's one inductive bias. And then all we really need is a demonstration for the actual physical interaction part. So once the robot is essentially touching the object, that's the bit where we need an, 
a physical demonstration to teach the robot how to then physically manipulate the object. So by dividing up a task into these two phases, this is one of the, one of the ways that we're actually getting much better data efficiency in my lab. Um, and I'm going to now tell you about this course defined imitation learning method and show you how it's actually trained. So first of all, this is the video I showed you a few moments ago. I provide a single demonstration. And that there, that kind of three seconds of human effort is the only human effort I need to teach a robot this task. I can then step back and the rest of it is fully autonomous. Now what happens is the robot is going to explore the object itself. Okay, so the robot is moving around the object here and it's collecting a data set. You can see the image at the bottom, that video, that's the images that the, the robot was collecting. And it's building up this data set of images and for each image it's recording where the robot needs to move in order to get to that, what I call the bottleneck pose, which is the pose where the hammer is just above the nail. And then what I do is I collect a second data set. So this time the robot is very close to the object. So the robot is exploring the object, as, again, building up this data set of images and actions. This time it's much, much closer to the object. So I've got these two data sets, one from when the robot is far away from the object, one from when the robot is very, very close to the object. The robot is doing all of this autonomously, so the human, as I said, just provides that one demonstration. They can step back. Um, this takes about 20 minutes or so of the data collection and then the, the learning. But the human can just go off and do whatever. And doesn't have to be, the human doesn't have to be there to reset the environment or physically uh, supervise the learning at all. And in terms of the actual deep learning, it's very, very simple. It's just supervised learning here. So what we're doing is we're taking the current image captured from that wrist camera putting it through a neural network and predicting the action that will move the robot to the end of that trajectory, essentially to the point where the demonstration started. Okay? And I'm doing this for two phases. There's the phase when the robot is far away from the object and then when the robot is near to the object, there's a second data set and a second neural network that kicks in. And then in terms of the actual deployment, this is, this is what happens. Okay, so the, the robot sees this nail in some arbitrary position on the table. And then it captures, it takes an image, and in, in a closed loop, it's going to move towards that object like this. So it's capturing images. Every single image it captures, it passes it through the neural network and predicts the action it needs to execute in order to move towards the nail. Then there's going to be a last inch correction. This is bringing in that second network that was trained, captured with data much closer to the nail. So you're going to see a little tweak to the robot's pose here. That. Very, very minor tweak, but it's, that's quite important to get a very accurate alignment. And then to actually perform the task, all the robot needs to do is replay the velocities from that human demonstration. So it's a very, very simple idea. All of this is just basic supervised learning with a neural network, um, moving the robot to the object and then replaying that demonstration. So I'm going to show you what this looks like now. So I'm going to show you, on the left is the hammer task. There's also a different task on the right here, um, which is opening a, uh, the lid of a box. Oh, something's gone wrong there. OK, let's, let's see. Oh, we're going too far ahead. We're getting a sneak preview. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop clicking. Let it settle. Okay. Okay. End of that slide. Right. Okay, so here are the demonstrations, the physical demonstrations. That's all I needed to do on this. I'm not showing the training, I'm just showing now moving on to the testing here. On the left, you've kind of seen all this, so maybe you can look on the video on the right. Here's the robot opening um, a box here. And the important thing here is that the, I'm going to move around these objects all over the table, and the robot is then able to interact with the object no matter where it is on the table. And this kind of behavior is just from literally three seconds or so of human interaction with the robot. 
and the robot's learning this quite complex skill, um, and it's a, an everyday task. You know, you can imagine this is the sort of task you want robots to actually do at home or in a factory or wherever you want a robot to be deployed. I'll show you some more examples here. The task on the left is particularly interesting because it requires dynamic control, okay? So this task on the left, scooping up the bag, that'd be really, really difficult to teach with something like reinforcement learning or supervised learning. It's a very, very complex policy. But simply by replaying the demonstration on the human and getting that really accurate alignment using the neural network, there's a very, very, very um, good chance that this is uh, going to work because you're, you're decomposing the task into this alignment and then replaying the, the human uh, demonstration. So you're getting this, what appears to be complex behavior from a very, very simple algorithm. The task on the right, you're going to see a failure case in just a moment, which is one of the things that we're still working on. So here, the knife is not going to quite make that slot, and it fails to put it in. The slot is like two or three millimeters wide, um, so there's a lot of, um, it requires a lot of precision, and if the camera resolution isn't high enough, or if there's not enough training data, then it, it could fail there. So that's one of the things that we're working on. Okay, I'm just seeing how much time I have. Right. And then um, we were able to show this working on all sorts of different tasks here. So we've got um, the task that I've shown you, but we've also got some other ones with the robot plugging in uh, a plug into a socket, uh, putting a dish into a rack, screwing in with a, with a screwdriver, with a, a screw on a toy airplane, um, and putting the, the lid on a bottle. So all of these kind of everyday tasks, each of them is taught just with that kind of three seconds of human interaction. But after that human interaction, there's this 20 minutes or so of data collection and training. And that's the thing that I've addressed in my more recent work, which I'm going to tell you about now. So in, in the previous, uh, in, in the method I just taught you about, we had this current image. We then trained this with supervised learning to predict the robot's velocity. Okay. The problem with this, as I said, it requires all of this data collection. You have to kind of sit around sit around waiting for the robot to collect this data, which is fine because, you know, the human doesn't have to be involved and that's okay, and we all know, you know training takes a long time and that's fine, we're kind of used to that. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if you could just provide a demonstration and then the robot will execute the task immediately after you've provided that demonstration without you having to wait for it to learn a task. So that's what we did in, in our more recent work. And again, a very, very simple method. It's a small tweak. Okay, instead of simply taking just the current image and predicting the velocity, we're going to take in two images to this neural network now. The current image and then this target image. So this target image is that image captured at what we call the bottleneck. So this is the point where the robot is just about to touch the object. And we're thinking, well, could we take in the pre-trainer network, essentially, that can take in two images and predict how to move from the current image to the target image. And if you have a network that can do this, then you can simply define a task um, to the robot. You can say, this is where I want you to move to. This is the target image. And then when it performs the task, it has all of these current images and then moves to that target image without having to actually train on that task because this network is pre-trained on other data. Um, and the really, really nice thing about this is we're, we are able to train this with simulated data only. Okay, so we didn't even have to collect that data in the real world. Um, so using computer graphics, we're able to generate lots of pairs of images, lots of pairs of current and target images. And in a simulator, of course, you know the geometry of the scene, and so you know uh, what is the transformation between where these two images are captured, and therefore you know what that label is that will move a robot from one image to the other. So I've done a lot of work in, in simulation to reality training in robotics before, and it works very well for vision. It doesn't work so well for complex dynamics, so if you wanted to train a robot something like screwing in a light bulb, um, it probably wouldn't work by teaching that entire task in simulation. But just, just the visual part of it, actually we can get very, very good photorealistic images in simulators these days that where you really can't tell the difference between the, the generated image and the real image. And so we can collect all of this data in simulation, which is even better because then we don't even have to collect any of this data in the real world at all, apart from defining that one task. So this is what that looks like now. This is one of my PhD students uh, running this experiment here. This, this whole thing is one continuous video stream, and it's important to uh, realize that. So what he's doing here is providing a task, 
showing demonstration of task where the robot is opening this lid and dropping the ball into it. Then what he's doing is the robot is immediately um, performing this task. There was no training there. The robot just knows how to do it because of this big pre-trained neural network. And now additionally, what we're going to do is put all these distractor objects in, and the robot again is able to perform this task, even though it's got all of these distractor objects. Because this network has been pre-trained in advance um, to essentially isolate that target object, then the robot is able to ignore all of these other objects. And even further, we can move the objects around, and the robot is going to, in real time, be adapting its controller and moving as that object moves around. So if there are disturbances, then the robot can adapt to those disturbances. So that whole thing was just one continuous video stream, showing a demonstration of the task, the robot then immediately performing that task in these conditions that has not even been explicitly trained on. And again, we tried this on a load of different tasks. So we've got some of these tasks that are similar to that first project that I showed you, scooping up a bag, hammering in the nail. Some of them are a little bit different, drawing, top right is drawing a little triangle on a, uh, a piece of paper. I've um, got a, a, a kind of a quite a precise insertion task on the bottom and the middle. Um, again, all of these, one continuous video stream. So showing that human demonstration, immediately the robot then is able to perform that task. And again, under all of these conditions, which are normally very, very challenging for robotics, where you've got uh, data which is essentially out of distribution. The robot has not actually seen any data like this. And it's just using that one pre-trained neural network to perform the task. Um, so that's, that's my talk, and um, I'll just finish off by saying where I think all of this is going. So, as I said at the beginning of the talk, it's very, very difficult to collect data for robotics, and um, we really need to some, some way to collect data for robotics to get the same quantity of data that has led to breakthroughs in other applications of machine learning, because often what we find is when we get that critical mass of data, suddenly that's enough data to lead to a breakthrough. In robotics, it's really, really difficult. So my vision is if we can come up with imitation learning algorithms that are extremely easy for humans to deploy, then this will lead on to sort of citizen science projects where people will buy a cheap robot arm for £1,000 or so, and they will at home start teaching that robot because it's just fun to teach a robot. And then through all of this data, we can share this data across the world, get this critical mass of data, which will then allow robots to share this data, share knowledge, and finally, we'll then have this big breakthrough in robot manipulation, which is this field, where robots can then perform lots of everyday tasks in everyday environments. So that's, that's why I see all of this going uh, in the future. And thank you for listening. <laughs>